So <coughs> we're going to sort of change pace and um, dive straight into sleep. And we are, again, very, very lucky that um, Alice and Archie have um, volunteered to be here today. Um, and I'm going to be trying to pretend that you're all not here <laughs> and um, chat with Alice and talk about sleep um, and hopefully um, give you an example of what I would normally do in a consultation with a family talking about sleep. Um, and so what will happen is you've got those um, another set of cards on your table um, which go through the steps of a sleep consultation. Um, you might like to flick through and just notice as I'm going through what covers, what's point, what card I'm covering at that time. We'll be using these cards again later in the day, but just to sort of help you um, structure and get an idea of what I'm doing and why. Um, yes. So, um, Excuse me, with the cards, given the space constraints on the table, you might even like to work in pairs and just lay down a card as you notice that Renee is dealing with that particular point. We, we just feel in terms of adult learning, having something physical to do, um, really laying down these templates of, of, of what's important to cover in a consultation has value. So we'd invite you to, to participate in that. Um, now, in a consult, I've had a little chat to Alice previously. Um, we were, I would take a history, so I'd go through the possum's five domains. Um, I will, would have asked her about the pregnancy, about the birth, um, about her health overall, um, baby's health. Um, we would have talked about feeds and um, seen, just heard a little bit about the journey. So for the purpose today, we're going to ask you to assume that we've gone through all those things and we're at the stage where there's nothing being flagged in those other domains that we need to address first. And just to highlight um, that for the younger babies, it's typically we really address feeds first before we'll start stepping into the area of sleep. Um, but for today, little Archie's 11 months old, and so we're going to um, tick the box that all those domains um, are okay, and we're talking just sleep today. Um, so thank you very much, Alice, um, for coming here today. And please feel free to do whatever you need to do um, to meet your needs and Archie's needs. So if he's up and moving around, then we can accommodate that. Um, so would you mind if we dive straight into sleep and we'll just hear a little bit about um, what sort of things Archie's doing at the moment, what his sleep patterns kind of look like. And if we start at the beginning of the day and we talk about um, what time he usually wakes to start the day, is there a time that he's up? Oh, well, sometimes he wakes at five, yes. but um, other times it's before six, about six or seven. Okay, yeah. so it could be anywhere five to seven. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Beautiful. And then when we move through, um, and I'm just assuming that Archie's your first yes. little one? Yes. Yep. So sometimes if they've got an older sibling, there's a toddler there, then I'll ask about what time the toddler wakes up because they're a great alarm <laughs> clock for the family as well. Um, so for then for the days, what do the days look like in regard to sleep? So we're, I'm trying to get a gauge of sort of how much day sleep, how often and when. So what are his naps like? Uh, he has two naps a day. Two naps? Um, yes. Probably the first one would be from about 9 o'clock or 9.30. Yes. Um, you might sleep for an hour and a half or an hour. Yep. And an then hour you to an hour and a half. Yeah, yep. and then you have a sleep in the afternoon. Yep. And what time would that um, be? Oh, it could be around 2 o'clock. 2, yeah. yep. And how long is that one? Oh, that could vary maybe an hour. An hour? Yeah, an hour and a half, yeah. Okay. Usually right. sleeps longer in the morning. Okay. Sometimes you'll have a two hour sleep in the morning and half an hour in the afternoon, yeah. Okay, so roughly it looks like it's, you know, about three hours yeah. total for yeah. the day. Yeah. Yep. He's just started childcare about three weeks ago, so. Daycare. And so, and how often does he go to daycare? Uh, four days a week. Four days a week. And what's. Is his sleep pretty much the same for those days? Yes, yeah, similar. I think, yeah, sometimes he has shorter sleeps there, but... Sometimes shorter? Yeah. Okay. And where does he sleep during the day? Does he sleep... In his cot. In his cot? Yeah. Yep. And is that in his own room? Yes. Yep. 
And is it light or dark in, in his room for those that dark? Dark? Okay. I like the light on the side. <laughs> <laughs> um, you probably follow me. And how does he usually fall asleep for those um, naps? I used to feed him to sleep, and now we've tried to get him to sleep in his cot. Okay. So and we usually have to pet him or... So you now pat, pat yeah. him to sleep? Yeah. Yep. And does that take very long? Uh, yeah, it can, yeah. So how yeah, long um, it Maybe like half an hour to 45 half minutes. Yep. Yeah, or sometimes quicker. Okay. And so they'll be patting him. And then for those day naps, does he ever wait? Do you ever need... Do you resettle him? Um, no, not anymore. No. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and so then we'll move to bedtime. Yep. Is there a time that you would roughly go to bed? Uh, around about seven. Seven? Yeah. Okay. And is that a similar process, popping him in his cot, patting? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, and how long does that take? Uh, about the same, yeah. About the same? Okay. All right. He likes to stand up in his cot, so it's... Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> Then for night time, so party time, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. So when does it all start? When would his first waking be? Um, about 8.30, 9.00. And after that? Um, oh, it really varies, but it could be sort of 11. Okay. Or 12. And, and then sort of in the early hours in the morning, he sort of wakes up a bit more. Okay. So, so he could wake up sort of four times. Four in total overnight? Yeah. Night. Yep. Okay. And what do you do when he wakes up? Um, <laughs> um, sometimes I, I feed him yes. um, a couple of times or I might put him in bed with me yep. or try and settle him in the, the cot. Okay. Okay. Um, and then does it, take you, does it take a while to resettle him? If it's in the cot, yes, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. And um, for yourself, do you find it, how long does it take you to get back to sleep? Um, no, I'm not too bad at getting okay. back to sleep. Okay, yeah. perfect. Okay. Have you ever heard any snoring? Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, this morning. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not something that happens all the time. Um, you know, he's got a, he's sort of, since he started childcare, he's had a, I okay. guess a cold. A cold, for, okay. About a month now. And he's well now. We've checked that box that he's well now. Yeah, he's still yeah. got the runny nose and okay. things. But Okay. So, hearing that story and hearing the patterns yeah. that he's in, I can um, see that there are lots that we could do yeah. um, to sort of nudge his body into a different pattern mm -hmm. where we might see some bigger, longer blocks of sleep okay. at, at night yeah. for you. Mm -hmm. So, what I think we might do is go through some facts about sleep mm -hmm. um, and oh. then go through and understand why his body's doing what it's doing okay. and then put together a bit of a plan mm -hmm. okay. how we could sort of see the nights become a little bit more manageable for okay. you. Yeah. Okay. Some of the things that we're going to talk about may be very different and in fact the complete opposite um, to what you've heard before about infant sleep. Yes. The approach we're taking here is we're really delving into why is his little body doing this, why is he's in these sorts of patterns of waking mm -hmm. at night. Um, certainly at his age, as he's getting older, teaching things to him does become yep. a lot easier and he's ready for that, um, as opposed to the very young babies. But I would be suggesting that if we worked with his, um, with his body and got him in a pattern where he was taking big blocks of sleep, mm -hmm. that layering some teaching on top of that if you wanted to, but you may find that you don't even need you to don't. then. Okay, great. All right. So, First thing about sleep, and sometimes this fact is all a family kind of needs to know, um, it's a really important one, we talk about how much mm -hmm. sleep, um, you know, is Archie taking. And often we're, we're um, seen or we've looked and we've, um, there's charts, there's lists that say a baby at this age should be taking this much sleep um, and having these many naps, when in fact there's no evidence to support yeah. those. Mm -hmm. um, and when we look into how much um, sleep do babies, little babies need, in fact, there's a really, really wide range of normal. So wide that for some babies are taking twice as much as other babies. Okay. So in the first 12 months of life, 
Um, there are some babies right down one end that are taking just over nine hours total in a 24 hour clock. So add up all the day and the um, night together total. It falls into a bell curve. So there are a lot of babies that fall in the middle range, but there are some babies at the other end that are taking just 18 hours total in a 24 hour clock. All completely normal. They were all developed to their potential based on whatever the sleep they're, they're needing it and taking at that time. Um, there was some studies in the Victorian sleep study that followed families up at two, four and six years of age. Um, they could not tell the difference of which babies were which in that first 12 months of life. So the patterns of sleep that he's taking now won't have impact on what he's doing at two, four and six years of age. Um, his body will be getting all the sleep it needs and so we don't need to be worried and it's the example is we're often thought about they need this much total sleep so that for brain development and things like that and a lot of families worry about they're not getting the sleep that this is saying this list is saying therefore their brain's not growing and I, I need to to match this number um, the 18 hour babies don't have brains twice as big as the nine hour babies it doesn't work like that um, his little body will be taking all the sleep it needs for his development so then we might just delve into a little bit about what your role as a parent is around his sleep. So it's acknowledging that sleep is just another function of the human body. So his gorgeous little body was born knowing how to breathe, knowing how to digest milk, all these functions. Sleep is just one of those things on that list. So he was born knowing how to sleep. As parents, it's not our role, it's not a teachable skill, okay. so we don't need to be concerned that we need to teach him how to sleep, okay. he knows how to okay. do that. Yep. Um, what our role is, is as parents, is to, to make it easy for his body to do what it needs to do. So it's removing obstacles. So it's things like he's fed, he's warm, he's dry, he's dialed down. Now the concept of the dial might be new to you, so and it's something we refer to a bit, so I'll quickly just go through. The dial is an analogy we use to replace the language around stress and stress hormones. Mm -hmm. So when he gets cranky, his little body, he dials up, yeah. and you'll be dialing up as well. And we look at steps of what then dials him down. So when he's dialed up, when the body's got stress hormones through it, it the body finds it really hard to take sleep easily. All right, so as parents, that's where the patting or before the feeds, they were all things that dialed him down. And then it's over to his little body to take the sleep. Okay, so whatever we're doing to dial him down isn't what's making him go to sleep. It's just removing the obstacles of those stresses inside to let his body take the sleep if it needs to. Does that make sense? So just teasing that apart a little bit about what we're doing and what our responsibility is around their sleep. So just to recap that, um, his little body will take all the sleep it needs and it's usually over about a three or four day period of time. Um, and that becomes important, that fact, when we're working with this plan. So he will, he, he's been getting all the sleep he needs and he will get all the sleep it needs. It's just that it's perhaps not in a pattern that's um, suitable for the rest of his family. Um, and that's the whole purpose of what we're doing, why we would consider changing. Because he could keep doing what he's doing and he's absolutely fine and he'll develop to his potential. What we're suggesting is nudging and changing his pattern so that he, you're in fact getting more restful nights and he's getting the best version of you. Yeah. All right, so that's why we're want, just wanting him to match into the family. Right? His little body will never sleep deprive itself that would ever affect his development. Yeah. So he's got lots of opportunities to take the sleep he needs, so we don't need to be concerned about that. Does that make sense? Okay. So, stepping on from there, um, we're, we might just delve into a little bit about how sleep works, so what's going on inside his body. I hope I'm not overloading you with too much information. <laughs> um, and usually what I'd be doing is I'd be dropping some notes down for you so that you can read over them. Um, so let's just step into understanding why he's waking up at night. There's two things inside the human body that regulate sleep, so that tell us how often to sleep, how long to sleep for, and they work together. The first, one of them is the circadian clock, mm -hmm. so that tells the difference between night and day. Profound effect on all the body systems, so it's really important that we get that one in a line, and we'll talk about that first step with that one. The other is this thing called sleep-wake homeostat. 
big phrase, we shorten it, we'll refer to it as sleep pressure. What that is, is that the human body emits hormones that make us sleepy. The longer we're awake, the higher those levels get to build. So sleep pressure gets built high. When it's high, we can fall asleep quickly and easily, and we're more likely to sleep a bigger block of time. So if we can relate it to not your pattern maybe now, but um, before you had little Archie, in the morning you would wake and your sleep pressure would be low. So those levels would be low. Across the day, they would build, 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 build. For some of us, they've built high enough by seven, eight o'clock at night that we could fall asleep easily and sleep big, long blocks all the way to the morning. For others, we wait longer. So it may be midnight before some others fall asleep easy and sleep big blocks, okay? We're looking for our little ones to fall into that similar sort of pattern. So we're looking that they start there um, in the morning, sleep pressure's low. But for them, their little bodies emit these, these hormones faster. So it starts low, they build up a bit quicker. And that's where day naps come in that they take the edge off. And it builds up again, day nap takes the edge off, builds up. All right? Still at bedtime, we're needing that sleep pressure high, so they fall asleep easily and quickly, and they take big, long blocks. Just for note for the wide differences between little ones, say the 18-hour babies, so those babies that take lots of sleep, their little body just emits these hormones a lot faster. So they start early, low in the morning, and really quickly, over a short period of time, that sleep pressure's risen really high, and they can have a big, long nap, awake for a little bit, shoots up really high again, another big, long nap. So they could have a few big, long naps, but for them, still at bedtime, the sleep pressure is really high, so they still take the big blocks overnight. For the little ones down the other end, so we go right down through that big, wide range of normal, down the other end, their bodies emit them a lot slower. So they start in the morning, and they can be awake for a lot longer and they can take just a very short quick nap to take the edge off. And it slowly builds again, another short quick nap, take the edge off. For them, we still need sleep pressure high, so they'll have their big blocks at night. What can happen is that in fact, we can find that little ones fall into a pattern where these day naps are taking too much of the edge off and they're going to bed and sleep pressure's not high enough. And when it's not high enough when they're going to bed, that's when we're not getting the big long blocks. So we're getting some more wakings happening overnight. And it's almost they fall into a pattern where their total amount of sleep is being taken, but it's been stretched across the 24 hours. And we're looking that they match more like your patterns where it rises to bedtime and then falls overnight. Okay, so what I'm suggesting for Archie and it's, you're going to start stepping ahead and guessing what my, the plan's going to be, and it's maybe not going to sound all that appealing, but we'll tease it apart, is that, in fact, perhaps Archie's two day naps are taking too much of the edge of his sleep pressure, um, and that's why he's waking and doing what he's doing at night. So we're going to be talking about a bit of a plan that will be seeing sleep pressure higher at bedtime, and that means gently nudging away some of these some of this total day sleep that he's having and I think it's important that we address it straight up that for a lot of families that's really unappealing and straight away you might feel inside you your dial going up at the thought of taking away some of that downtime that you have during the day and that comes from hooking together self-care needs mm -hmm. with when my baby sleeps okay. yeah. and that can work for some families who have babies that have these big long blocks and high sleep totals. But if we have a little one that doesn't have those high sleep totals, we need to somehow unhook self-care from when my baby sleeps. Okay. So it doesn't mean that self-care gets pushed aside. We bump it up, but we start being creative with how we get our self-care needs met. Um, and we'll talk a little bit in our plan, okay? so. Remember when I talked about, so looking ahead for this plan, remember when I talked about circadian clock, the two mm -hmm. regulators of sleep? There's lots and lots of good quality research done around the circadian clock and it's really clear in the evidence that if we have a consistent wake time, it helps our body adapt and change that much quicker. 
so the body clock change. So it goes along with jet lag as well. So if we ever travel, if we want to change our body clock over to the new time zone, we pick a wake time and stick with it and be quite consistent with that. So our bodies would feel about an hour's difference. His little circadian clock sought to be a lot more sensitive. So when we pick this wake time, we really want it pretty tight. So um, maximum 10, 15 minute window, but it's almost like we, we want to have some lovely music, or I hate saying the word alarm, but an alarm or something that comes on that really keeps that wake time consistent for him. Now for you, there's a wide, he's been going five, till seven, you know, a wide range. I would be suggesting when you pick it that it's roughly around what he has been doing um, and it fits with the family when the family's getting up and getting busy anyway. Um, If you said 9am, I would say, well, you're starting the day with a big battle ahead of you there. So um, you might say, you know, six. Um, It might be a discussion that you have with um, family of what suits what suits your family of what would be a time to start the day. Um, Up until that point, it's dark, it's night time, but I'm just, I'm going to pick six and just say that, but I'm not telling you that's what it has to be, but let's say you chose six, um, that at six o'clock, blinds open, windows, you know, there's natural light coming in. If we can get natural light hitting his skin, it tells every cell in his body that day started. Um, So house gets bright, noisy, daytime. It's It's very, very different to what the night's been doing. Some families feel comfortable to wake their little baby at whatever time, at the six. Um, Others don't feel comfortable. So that's where, again, you're using your dial. Does that feel something that I feel comfortable doing? If you do feel comfortable doing that, picking him up and favourite activity, a feed or by a window with natural lights, perfect. If you don't, just making the environment around him very different, very daytime, so some noise and things going on. From there, all day sleeps, we're wanting to be in daylight. So we're, we're not wanting to trick his little body into thinking it's nighttime. We're wanting his body to know very clearly it's daytime, the world is going on out there, I'm just taking the edge of just what I need to get back out there into the world and explore it. So um, for him, it might be just opening those curtains, yeah, keeping that room bright. Um, Some families really change the whole um, place of sleep during the day. So um, it may be out in the living room, you know, where it's bright and noisy and busy anyway. But this is, these little steps, we just take whatever feels comfortable for you. And it doesn't need to be big leaps straight up. You might just take small steps. So your first step may be just okay, sleeping him in his room with the windows open and let's just watch how much sleep he takes then, all right? Um, How we nudge, so uh, roughly at the moment he's taking about three hours and we know that that three hours is supporting these patterns of night. So we need to change, but we don't know by how much. And we want to nudge as gently as we possibly can. We don't want to dial all the family up. So if you were to say, great, okay, he's going to sleep all night. Tomorrow you're sleeping 10 minutes and that's it. That would be an awful day and an awful night and it's not going to be helpful. So we want to nudge some of this total away. But the important thing is it's consistent. So the first step you might take is just bright room and notice. Does his body start to take less sleep itself? Um, you might decide that um, the days, right, I'm going to get out of the house every day and these naps are just going to be on the go. Um, a lot of families, when I say that, think, oh my gosh, that's just a huge leap. But in fact, that can often be the easiest way, this easiest path, because once you get out there, the whole world helps pass time, meets his sensory needs, helps to pass his time where it's um, a lot easier than being at home and trying to fill that time for him. Um, so we're nudging away the total. <laughs> no, bite, don't bite, mum. <laughs> um, so we're nudging away that, that total. Bedtime. We're looking that. So do you know when he's taking a while to fall asleep? So the patting when it takes 30 to 40 mm-hmm. minutes. It's what you're doing there is just passing time until his sleep pressure rises up and you're just keeping him dialed down by patting or whatever. And then it's eventually his sleep pressure is high enough his body falls into a sleep. So unless you really enjoy that time, I'd be suggesting that 
we could pass that time doing something more enjoyable. So if he's not falling asleep quick and easy, it means that he's just not ready to fall asleep. So we can nudge those boundaries. Um, Often we'll talk to families about um, when you think they would be getting tired, consider maybe are they cueing that they're bored? So it helps you just step away and go, okay, let's do one more activity. And then we'll go, then we'll see if it's that you need to fall asleep. All right. And it's similar to bedtime. Essentially, if we're nudging bedtime a little bit later, we're giving his body time for that sleep pressure to build higher. So if, um, just being gen- very generalised here, but if your partner's been out of the house during the day and they come home, often that's a time that families are, okay, it's dinner, bed, it's dinner, bath, bed, sh- everyone be quiet. But maybe we could just flip all that and shake it up and really see it's time to do another activity. Go for a walk, go to the park, um, bath time might be longer. That's a perfect time if you're lucky enough that you could capture some um, self-care if you've got a partner that comes home where they spend time and you check out for a while and do whatever you enjoy doing that um, means something for you, recharges you. Um, But we don't want to be rushing into bed. And I completely get it that it's a long, long day and we're just looking at that bedtime and thinking, come on, come on, come on, to pop him down. So that can be a really hard, hard step to take and to start to consider doing. Um, but what it does is it rises sleep pressure that we're looking that we get these bigger blocks overnight. At night time, you do whatever works to get everyone back to sleep the quickest. All right. So we're actually addressing the nights by all this work during the day. By letting, by doing whatever works at m- night means that we're clocking up every possible second of sleep so that we have the ability to do this nudging during the day. Um, so if it's a feed and everyone's back to sleep, we'd, I'd say go for it. Yep. It ticks a lot of boxes because um, a feed just dials him down for whatever reason it could have been that he was dialed up a feed ticks all the boxes and is a wonderful way to dial him down also it helps you get back to sleep quickly too Um, so we'd see that we're not creating bad habits he's not waking because you have been feeding him yeah it's just a tool that we're using to get everyone back to sleep the quickest all right so um, we're not suggesting he, he may not be hungry every time he wakes up and we don't need to tease it apart we just do what works, okay. all right? Um, and so the, the purpose is that we use it as a tool. So in fact, we're getting nights where there's big blocks and we're not feeding that frequently anymore. Okay. Does that make sense? Now, a couple of things are important that um, whenever we're nudging, we need to be consistent. So do you remember when I said that the human body will take all the sleep it needs over about a three or four day period? So there'll be some catch up. So what may happen, because what you do one day doesn't necessarily impact that night. So you might nudge and say today he had two and a half hours sleep total. Mm -hmm. Tonight is the same as always, the frequent wakings. Next day, he still only had two and a half. That night, still frequent wakings. And it could do that for, you know, a couple of days and a few nights. But there comes a point in time over this three or four day period where his body sort of says, I'm down a bit of sleep catch up if he has uh, that day big long day sleeps he's kind of undone all the work that you've been doing in the nudging and he would stay with the same pattern so that day we really want to keep through and he only has the two hours and the catch up two and a half hours the catch up happens at night time and that's the beginning of changing the patterns that's why you can never tell yes yes and that's quite often why um some families goes oh I've tried this, we had a big day at the zoo and they didn't sleep at all and we thought they were going to sleep all night and they didn't. And that's because it's consistency. It's really, it's over that three or four day period of time. All right. We need to, the reason we keep this consistent wake time is that we need to watch that there's not those sneaky catch-ups here and there. And so when you were um, talking that he goes to daycare four days a week and he has sometimes less sleep, that's a wonderful advantage. Yeah. So they're helping you do this nudging and okay. we just keep with that. What we have to watch, and it may be a conversation that you have with daycare, is that you don't do the work the three days of the week and then he goes to daycare and has these big long catch-ups yeah, there. Okay. So it really needs that everyone caring for him is on board and is with this consistent nudging that he does. If you get to that day where he wants to catch up and 
you just can't nudge through. He's cranky. He just wants to sleep and he just doesn't want to find any joy. He just wants to sleep. We're not suggesting you poke him and keep him awake all day. It's nothing. When you feel he needs to sleep, you follow those cues and think, okay, he's catching up and he's kind of undoing some of this work that we've been doing. Um, and we're going to start again. But what we've learned is that we perhaps nudged a bit too much. We took too much of a bite out. So say, for example, you had nudged down to two and a half hours, you might do two, two hours, 45 minutes okay. and do that consistently. Mm -hmm. All right? cool. What we'd suggest is that you go week by week. Okay. So see something that you think for the week ahead, what could I manage? And for you, it may be we're just going to this consistent wait time because that's going to be a big change. Okay. Um, and he may just sleep, I'm just going to lift the curtains in his room. Mm -hmm and notice what happens. And essentially you assess week by week. So after a week you notice, okay, are nights, are they improved? Are they now manageable? Or is there still some room for improvement? And if there's still room, you just nudge that little bit more for the next week that's to come, right? And you just do that week by week by week. Is cutting your naps down and also um, bringing back a little bit of both, both if you okay. can. Yep. yep. What can happen is that if you cut the naps and then we're saying nudge bedtime, you're hearing this awful time okay. in the evenings that he's had less sleep and we're trying to get him a little bit later. Okay. So it's small bites. Mm -hmm. um, it might be this, that you take the approach that if he's happy and having fun at quarter to seven, we don't need to stop and jump into um, night mode and quickly get him into bed. If it was five minutes, ten minutes later, then that's in the direction okay. we're wanting mm -hmm. to. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, a lot of the two things that a lot of families um, ask me about is what about um, the idea sleep, breathe, sleep? So you may have heard that get the day sleep sorted and then the nights will follow. Mm -hmm. Now when we understand how sleep works, we know that that just isn't the case. Okay. It just isn't how human sleep works. The more sleep we have during the day, well, we would do it. We'd have naps during the day so we could stay up and keep awake for the whole movie yeah. at night time. It's the same, same for them. Okay. Okay, Just so a five-minute warning. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so sleep doesn't breed sleep. Okay. And another um, topic that a lot of families are concerned about is the idea of them getting overtired. Mm -hmm. And it's like this big fear, I've got to get in early or we're told get in early before they get overtired. If we tease apart what actually is going on in those situations, physiologically we can't get overtired. The body will just keep getting more tired and take sleep. You know, for us we have micro naps and things like that. Mm -hmm. So the body will take sleep. We can't get past being tired. Mm -hmm. But we, the little ones can get, and we do too, can get cranky. So we can get dialed up. When you think of your role as a family is to dial down and then the human body takes sleep. Mm -hmm. But often what happens is a little one is getting really quite tired and really dialed up. And a family says, you are so tired and cranky, sleep is the answer. So go to sleep, go to sleep, go to sleep. And it may be into a dark room and lay down and pat or whatever the situation. But that action isn't dialing them down. And they're dialed up so their little body can't fall asleep even okay. if they desperately okay. want to. So if we just step back and go, you are so tired and cranky, come here and dial down. And at that dialing down may be very different to what you interpret, it might, what you think would dial you down. So it might be back into that party room where it's all noisy. It might be walking around outside. Okay. It might be, you know, bouncing up and down. So anything that dials them down then step in, sleep will happen so quickly. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's really acknowledging that when they're really tired and cranky, our role is to dial them down in whatever works for them and then sleep happens so quickly. Okay, does that make sense? Yes, yes. yeah, it does. Yep. Yeah. So um, stepping through this, using your dial with what you feel comfortable with, but understanding how the sleep works means that you can just tease this apart okay. a little bit. I've just remembered one fact right back at the beginning when we're talking about the total amount of sleep mm -hmm. that little ones take. That total changes. It goes up and down a lot in that first 12 months of life. So that can help you answer when there may have been periods of time where it was okay yeah. and then it wasn't okay. Um, and so it, when it changes a lot. Um, so when we notice that nights are um, becoming a little bit more unmanageable, it may be, oh, the total has dropped a little bit more. Okay. So he's needing less day sleep. Okay. To support manageable nights. Okay. That makes sense? Yes, yes. yes.
Okay. Yeah, yeah. Did Definitely. you have any questions? Um, so, so he, I guess, still have two sleeps a day, or do you break that into he one? He may. Or? We don't know where the new pattern will be that mm-hmm. supports bigger, longer blocks of sleep at night, and that's all over to experiment. Okay. Um, certainly you might find that actually when I would usually interpret him being sleepy and ready for sleep we keep going we actually get quite a a lot more fun in and we can do a lot more different activities and move around and he not he's not truly ready for sleep until much later and that may be your spot there oh he's dropped a nap yeah okay. um, so exploring that so it doesn't matter necessarily you know two smaller naps one nap it's usually the total okay yeah. we want to try and avoid naps that are too late in the afternoon evening because mm-hmm. as you imagine that sleep pressure is rising a nap there really drops it yeah. and it take a lot more time for to reach up for okay. bedtime okay yeah. so there's no set bedtime for him um, it's a pattern where it matches your family Same. okay yeah if you imagine a, uh, an 18 hour baby they may go to bed at six wake at six and have three two-hour naps whereas a baby whose total is 10 hours if they're going to bed at six they're waking at 4 a.m. and that's no day sleep yeah okay. so that pattern for that family might be an eight o'clock bedtime five waking and a nap during the day so it's it's a bit of a number yeah okay. you find that pattern that suits your little one and your family. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. That's okay. Great. So, did I keep within my time? <laughs> okay. So, I wonder whether there were questions from the floor. We'll, we'll be doing other sleep um, demonstrations throughout the day, but please um, bring up anything that comes to your mind. Um, if your baby, so we've got the, you know, say the five to seven sort of wake up time, you pick a six o'clock, but then they wake at five, like you're having, if they're not, it's easy if you need to like wake them up, but what if they keep yes. wanting to sometimes wake before and Good five question. o'clock and I don't want to get up at five o'clock? <laughs> so we keep it night mode. So it's dark, it's quiet, it's lazy. So it may be, you know, cuddle, you want to stay as horizontal as you can. So it's whatever passes that time. Sometimes for a family, actively getting up and trying to get them back in the cot and trying to get over, just dials everybody up and it's, it's not helpful at all. So it's passing that time in night mode. So a cuddle yep. in bed can, can be helpful. That makes sense. Thanks. Yep. Um, I think I probably know the answer to this question anyway. Um, say you've got a baby that you've decided we're going to experiment with two and a half hours of sleep a day rather than three. Um, are we waking that baby up when they've had their two and a half hour daytime sleeps? Um, if, at, sorry. Yeah, at the sort of two and a half hour mark. If you feel comfortable with that. Um, so some families are quite happy to, to look at the clock. If they don't feel comfortable with waking their baby, that may be a strategy of changing the place of sleep for the baby so that they're more in tune with there's things going on and wake themselves. Um, and or it might be for that family, they have a week or so where they're busy during the day, they're out of the house um, and naps are happening on the go for them. Can I jump in there? Because given that Archie's 11 months old, you know, a lot of 12 month olds are dropping their daytime nap mm-hmm. and this is completely normal, um, but they may be at the lower end of the bell curve. So if there is excessive night waking, um, um, you know, the, the pattern of, of every hour or even more often through the night and we're aiming to compress that sleep up against the get up time, then with an 11 month old actively shrinking that daytime sleep by getting them up or, you know, or being out and about and having sleep so much on the go, you're never trying to keep the little one asleep, you're just doing what you want to do to have a good day, um, then that, that daytime nap's starting to shrink away. And I, I didn't say that our whole approach is daytimes for living, nighttimes for sleeping. So really seeing daytime for Archie is all about him exploring this world and seeing and hearing and being part of all these new things. And sleep is just something that gets in the way of him doing that. 
So it's really flipping how we see day sleep. Renee, thank you very much. Two quick questions. One, how do dream feeds um, fit into this schedule? I know there are mums out there who are encouraged to do dream feeds or rollover feeds for their babies. And secondly, would you mind commenting on some of the parenting programs that are very prescriptive uh, for all you Melbourne people? Masada comes to mind, which is so different. So if anyone... Yeah, so if anyone who's not from Victoria, Masada is a very prescriptive program. It's an um, inpatient sleep parenting unit. So babies are put on a very sleep-wake cycle um, with a very prescriptive nap time and awake period and they're not allowed to sleep in their awake time and they have to be in their cot during their sleep time. It doesn't mean they need to be sleeping, but they need to be in their sleep time. Uh, would you mind commenting on that? <laughs> so let's, let's first do dream feeds. So... Um, very much some families swear by dream feeds and it's not something I suggest that they need to do and we're stepping aside from when there's feeding issues and weight gain concerns and things like that. Um, but we would see that the driver of sleep is in, in fact sleep pressure. So if we're looking for those bigger blocks of sleep at night, it's increasing sleep pressure. Um, so I would invite a family if they felt that staying up for that feed um, was a bit of a chore, um, I'd invite them to start experimenting and seeing what happens when they don't um, and certainly addressing what's happening during the day. Um, so the other um, question you had, the what we would term the first wave behavioural approaches to sleep, um, I often will suggest, will explain to families, they may work for some families um, and typically if they did, it was because that sort of pattern matches that baby's overall total at that point in time. But in fact, they can be coming undone. Um, they can be coming undone as their total changes a lot. And I think we're really going to delve into the impact of that sort of prescriptive approach it has on mum's mental health. Um, and I would be suggesting it doesn't equip the family with any understanding of how sleep works and that their little one's going to be changing so much um, that repeatedly over and over they're going to need to be um, readdressing these first wave behavioural approaches each stage that the baby changes. Um, so certainly we often obviously get lots of families that have been down that path um, and it hasn't worked. It's quite clear for them that it hasn't worked and I'll highlight it for them that it didn't work because it didn't match your baby's total. Um, it's not because you were rubbish at implementing it and you needed to be stronger and waited out longer. Um, that in fact it just doesn't work for your baby. It can also help to let parents know that um, um, if you look at the international literature in the first 12 months of life, our infants are going to sleep more like 8.30, 9 o'clock at night in a way that's better aligned with the parents' bedtime, actually. Um, I think the huge thing for those families is really addressing unhooking self-care from when baby sleeps because if we look at why are families so desperate to have their babies sleep for those times and be in bed at bedtime at 6pm, it's because they desperately just so want this downtime. So a lot of it is addressing really, and we haven't done here brainstorming, the activities you choose during the day, um, the support systems that you have, they're all focused on doing things that you enjoy and recharge and baby coming along. Just Renee, I have yep. So from what age is this approach uh, applicable and suitable? Um, antenatally I talk about certainly not this nudging but I talk about just what healthy sleep looks like the realities of, of baby sleep um, and just to set the daytimes for living night times for sleeping and normalizing that cat naps are normal for some you know and that's fine it's not something that we have to have a sleep focused um, and then right through then okay. um, but obviously addressing feeds first if, for these younger ones it sounds so beautiful and fits with lots of mom's values and mm -hmm. I, it's so different to other ones. Mm -hmm. How successful is it before I start telling everybody? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well maybe I can jump in there because um, early last year we had Prof Helen Ball from the Durham University Parent Infant Sleep Lab do her sabbatical um, with us and uh, th this was because she argues that our program, the Possum Sleep Program, is the only um, program available internationally that really aligns with the latest neuroscience and sleep science. And so she um, kindly conducted a preliminary evaluation for us 
it's very early in our research journey, um, but it was very positive. Um, so it's now being adapted. We're collaborating um, with them in the UK. They're, they're currently um, doing the first phases of what's going to be an RCT. Um, they're calling it, they've taken the sleep, possum sleep program and they've just sort of tweaked it a bit for the UK context. Um, so th there's a lot of interest in it. Um, we get incredibly positive feedback in our clinic. That's been the case in our preliminary evaluations. Um, you know, I, I do have the view, I guess, that in 20 years' time this will be, um, you know, quite a dominant approach be because we know from the evidence that the first wave behavioural approaches such as being implemented at Masada, they don't decrease night waking in the first 12 months. We've got four systematic reviews that show that. One is a systematic review of RCTs. Um, um, you know, and there's not reliable um, evidence there to show that they improve maternal mood. So we're, we're really at the cusp of a paradigm shift um, and it's into this place that we're offering our sleep program. So I'm just thinking, Deb, in terms of, shall we just, um, we've, we've got other blocks for sleep put aside during the day. We were intending to move into some acceptance and commitment therapy exercises now. Are you comfortable if we put on hold the conversations that, that we're wanting to have around sleep until a little bit later on? We've got another helper family coming in. So we, we might just close sleep there temporarily, if you don't mind, um, and thank Alice and Archie. I'll let Deb um, do that. Is that work? Oh, now it is, yeah. Um, I'd sincerely like to thank you, Alice and Archie, because you kept me very well entertained for the last <laughs> little while. You are an absolute delight. Um, really appreciate you giving up your time and coming um, and helping us out. And we just have a, a little thank you gift for you. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you so much. Your favourite? Freckles. Oh, good. Awesome. <laughs> well <Yeah. done. laughs> So if everybody could just um, thank Thanks Alice so and Archie. Much. And just to remind Alice that we have the Possum Sleep film available online. So if you have questions, there's all that resource there as well to go into on the possumsonline.com website. I generally let parents know because, you know, then they can get their partners or other carers on board as well. If the partner hasn't come along, often the partners are there. But. Actually, we could probably just take one more sleep question while Deb's doing this. Yes, yes. 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 Uh, all had very different total sleep needs, so I really identify that, and I wish I'd done this before my first because she was the tricky one. Yes. My third probably has needed the most sleep, and and I have had to sort of wake her up more often than not when she was really little. Yep. Um, uh, she still has a higher sleep need than the other two, but has FOMO, so often we'll <laughs> of course <laughs> two big it, siblings. Which, um, and I have I notice if I get her to bed at that first sleep pressure at around seven, she sleeps beautifully. But if I miss it, it's really hard to get to sleep, and she still will wake several times crying in the night because she's, I know you say don't use the word overtired, but that is mm. what I observe in mm. her. Mm. So what do you do when, when you've pushed, when we have overridden their natural sleep pressure? Yep, yep. I think all we can do is just continue to focus on keeping her as dialed down as possible. The way I say it, just sort of thinking more broadly, is, is that Actually, if we're wanting really positive developmental outcomes around sleep, so as Renee showed you, we've unpacked this, what I would argue is a completely erroneous reading of the research that says that if you don't get sleep happening well now, then you're going to compromise not only sleep habits down the track, but cognitive and behavioural development. That's, that's a real misinterpretation of the evidence, actually. It causes parents a great deal of grief. Um, so we've unpacked that, and then I say, it's, it's, it's my belief, um, because I'd love to demonstrate this in research, but at the moment it's my belief, that actually the way to get really positive sleep outcomes throughout childhood is to have sleep easy, no fuss, associated with cuddles and joy and relaxation. Um, <clears throat> that the easier we make sleep, which means letting it be driven by sleep pressure, 
with a good setting of the circadian clock in a relaxed way if there's no real sleep problems. But the circadian clock is set by how families start the day and then driven by sleep pressure in the evenings. When that little one, if we're talking older children, is nice and tired, the sleep pressure is high, then a cuddle and a story off to sleep is actually, it's easy and it's easier, it's quick. It's, it's quicker than, than having to engage night after night with, with the sleep struggles around a little person who, I don't want you to leave the room, you know. Um, so uh, with your specific situation of a little one who really does seem to kind of get dialed up and then is, is perhaps waking because she's dialed up in the night, if you like, it seems to me that the more we can, I'm sure this is what you're doing anyway, but just keep it all relaxed and dialed down, um, without, without um, kind of a great deal of worry around sleep, really. Um, uh, well, I, I certainly, I certainly think that um, rather than doing bedtime by the clock, we do get up times by the clock, and um, and then have bedtimes really relaxed and easy. So you might give it a go with story time and a cuddle and it's clear that, that, that she's just not ready. And it could be because she does hear the other bigger kids having a great time out there. But if we're really relaxed about that, I think it's true that in a society that has a great deal of sleep anxiety, and I, I wouldn't presume that this is what's happening in your family, but just as a little sort of segue into something that might be useful. Um, then, then our little ones start to develop this, it's like a, a bedtime aversion, you know, and, and, um, and, and in fact the, 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 the sort of worst end of it is when you really see a condition dialing up, you go anywhere near that cot or anywhere near the bed and that child really starts to dial up. So it does seem to me that the more relaxed, easy, cuddly, low fuss we can make sleep, the better overall for, for developmental outcomes. There are many parents using the Wonder Weeks app. I'm not sure. Yeah, so I was yeah. wondering if you would mind commenting on uh, some of those parents who are saying, well, my baby's going through developmental leaps every so often. They'll be more clingy, wanting more feeds. Their sleep will drop off. Um, how does this routine fit in with that? I was wondering if you could comment on whether you believe in yep, yep. the Wonder Weeks app or those developmental leaps and their impact on sleep and behaviour. Yes, and yes, sure. Maybe not a quick one. Yeah, no, well, I, I probably fairly quick because I see the Wonder Weeks concept as on the whole, you know, very positive because it normalises um, all those changes from week to week um, that we see in our our babies and it it um, you know it's it's depathologizing it's it's um, inviting parents to to kind of go with the particular um, changes that are emerging over the weeks and months so to my mind all of that's you know that's positive in fact I did spend a little bit of time at one stage drilling down a little bit into the various predictions about you know, the, the, the time range for particular developmental events. And particularly for the younger babies, there's these incredible overlaps. I'm, I'm not so sure that it's, it's, it's actually useful in terms of, you know, infants are so incredibly variable in the way they develop. Um, but on the whole, I think, why not? It's, it's, um, it's normalising. And that's the great strength, I think, of Wonder Weeks. The idea of the, the four weeks, four months sleep regression, we'll deal with it later because I can see Deb's all set to go. Don't let me forget four months sleep regression, we'll deal with it later. <laughs>